Mmh. Voilà. Tenez maintenant euh, votre langue dans le bouton en forme de globe sur votre écran et assurez-vous de rester dans la même langue pendant tout l'événement. N'hésitez pas à nous, euh, à nous faire part de vos questions et commentaires dans la chat box ou dans la boîte questions-réponses. Uh, hola a todas y a todas, bienvenidos al la, uh, lanzamiento de la sexta edición del informe sobre el progreso en la implementación de los ODS a nivel nacional. Antes de comenzar, eh, recuerden que este evento cuenta con interpretación simultánea en español, inglés y francés, eh, por lo que por favor seleccione el canal en el que desea escuchar eh, este, este evento y permanezca en el mismo idioma durante todo el evento. Eh, asimismo, le pedimos que comparta todas sus preguntas y todas sus sugerencias con nosotros en la caja de diálogo o en la caja de preguntas y respuestas de Q&A. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Dardre, I think. Yeah, so just over to Luisa, who's going to be the overall moderator for today. So over Luisa, Luisa. Cordoba. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Deirdre. And like Arturo said, welcome to the global launch of the Progressing National SDGs Implementation Report. My name is Luisa Cordova from CEPE. Uh, I'm saying hello to you today from Washington, DC. Uh, it is my honor to be here with everyone joining us from every continent and time zone to share in the process of this report's uh, important sixth edition. CEPE is an independent nonprofit think tank founded 20 years ago and headquartered in Bogota, Colombia. Our mission is to empower people and institutions with data and analysis to find pathways towards sustainable development. Thank you so much to everybody on this webinar and especially to the organizers for this timely space And I will now hand the microphone over to Sarah Strack, Director of Forest, who will say a few opening words. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Luisa. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you're based. And also a very well, warm welcome from my end to the launch of the Progressing National SDGs Implementation Report. Um, This report, this assessment, has been produced by a coalition of 13 civil society organizations, which include Action for Sustainable Development, Action Aid, ANND, Bond, CEPE, Cooperation Canada, the CSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness, FORUS, Global Focus, IASD, Save the Children, Sight Savers, and World Vision. And this coalition looked at the 42 voluntary national reports that were submitted to the UN High Level Political Forum last year in 2021. As most of you will know, every year, a number of countries present their VNR as part of the follow-up and review process to indicate the status of SDG implementation at the national level. These official reports are meant to be prepared through inclusive and participatory processes to showcase good practice, lessons learned, as well as challenges in implementation, and also to provide a basis for peer learning and accountability at the global level. And while these reports are voluntary, it's necessary to cast an eye on what they contain and how they're being elaborated. And this is what this coalition of civil society organizations has decided to do for the sixth time now, providing a great example of how civil society can work cooperatively to contribute to improving the implementation of the sustainable development goals by highlighting best practices, but also gaps and challenges. And the sixth edition of this report, as you've heard from Luisa, allows us to extract some pretty interesting trends, which you'll hear about in the coming presentations and roundtable discussion. We will also hear some interesting findings from representatives from some of the governments who will share with us their experience of the elaboration of their VNR and what they learned in the process. And we'll hear from the perspectives of the UN and of the EU Commission, which are also very involved in this agenda, of course. What we can see in this assessment, in this report, is that while there have been improvement in some aspects, such as the connection between the, the national and the regional levels, and also the integration of the lean of no one behind principle, there have also been clear overall trends that go in the wrong direction, unfortunately. And one of these trends 
is the decrease of engagement of non-state actors in VNR preparation. Another worrying trend that you'll hear about today is that these VNR reports seem to brush under the carpet the problem of shrinking civic space, of the delegit delegitimization of civil society and of attacks on rights defenders and activists. And this is a big concern for many civil society organizations. And the absence of these issues in the VNR is, is even more unacceptable that we have seen since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, an acceleration both in the speed and in geographies of restrictions on civic space, which severely impact the ability to implement the SDGs in a meaningful and inclusive way. So we are now in 2022. It's the seventh year of um, SDG implementation. And we all know that the pace to achieve the SDGs is not fast enough and that we even have been backsliding in some areas. But this is not a fatality. Some countries have or are already reporting for the second or even the third time. And so while we have seen progress in some areas, there's an urgent need to move faster, to further improve implementation and reporting and to seize the opportunity that the HLPF and the VNRs present to build a global community of SDG champions that lift each other up to accelerate positive change. I hope that this conversation today will contribute a little bit to that. And I would like to welcome you all once again and to thank you for participating in this event today. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Sarah, so much for this uh, enticing opening, especially about trends and findings, which I'm sure we we all would really want to um, dive in. So I, I think this was a perfect and energetic way to welcome Shannon Kinderney from Cooperation Canada. Shannon, thank you for being here and over to you. Great, thank you so much uh, for having me. Hello, colleagues, partners, and friends. Uh, it's really a pleasure to give some opening remarks to you uh, here today. I'm joining you from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people, colonially known as Ottawa here in Canada. And as many of you may know, part of our path towards truth and reconciliation includes recognizing the lands on which we now reside here in Canada. Cooperation Canada has been responsible for the publication of the Progressing Report for five years. And so we've reviewed the VNRs submitted from 2016 to 2021. And in that process, I think you'll hear a lot of the trends uh, analysis that we're able to describe, picking up on some of the points Sarah's made and in the presentation my colleague Anna will make shortly. This work followed on the very good work of Bond, as many of you know, our sister network in the UK had, that reviewed the English BNRs in 2015. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about how this work has grown and some of the impacts that we've achieved over this time period. This work grew from that first report that Bond had produced to include many new partners year on year, to see a joining up of efforts, additional analysis made, and a new examinations of best practice, good practice, and progress across countries. More recently, we've added policy briefs that focus on key topics of concern for civil society, governments, and international institutions. But what's remained the same over this evolution of this work of the progressing report has been our commitment to an independent, holistic review of the VNRs. Progressing remains one of the most comprehensive and critical reviews of the VNR processes and Im implementation of the 2030 agenda. We move beyond reviews that simply summarize the VNRs to adding a constructive and evidence-based critical perspective on our shared progress. And importantly, we incorporate the views from civil society parallel reports, allowing for some fact-checking and some ground-truthing against what we see in the VNR reports themselves. And these reports have made so many important contributions and continue to do so where the aim of improving accountability for implementation. So informing of the UN's system of reporting and tracking and offering options on how to improve that. Raising awareness of good practices. We know that governments and many other stakeholders are looking for innovative ideas, um, not wanting to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. And our report pulls a lot of these really helpful pieces together, making it easier for us to look to where good examples 
in progressing on implementation exist. And of course, this work has always aimed to support civil society. Um, you know, the examples of parallel reporting that we draw in and ways to improve such reporting, but also pulling out the averages, the good practices that civil society can advocate to government and the UN for all of us to do better. And we've achieved a lot with this report. Civil society has demonstrated its thought leadership and positioned this report as a go-to reference point in conversations with the UN, uh, presenting at the high-level political forum, for example, in discussions with partners for review, working with UN DESA, including the UN Knowledge Exchange workshops on BNRs. This report has been launched globally year on year, and it's informed discussions at the UN regional forums. We've seen reference to it in VNR reports by governments, and we've engaged governments on the best practices identified. We've also informed revisions to the UN's VNR voluntary reporting guidelines, participating as experts in these discussions. And finally, we've consistently launched this report through a multi-stakeholder approach, convening representatives from the UN, from government, from civil society, international organizations, recognizing the value of this work for all stakeholders and in our shared efforts towards 2030. This year is a special year, as it's Cooperation Canada's last year as the publisher of this report. After our five years working with amazing partners, we're so excited to pass the reins over to Action for Sustainable Development to Ollie Hyman and his team. Ollie, we know this report is in good hands with you and your team and will benefit from the rich experiences and perspectives from the A4SD membership. I hope to see our global civil society efforts to ensure accountability in VNR processes and for 2030 agenda implementation continue to grow under your excellent leadership. For our part, Cooperation Canada remains committed to our shared efforts, and we look forward to working with you and all of our partners on next year's annual review of the VNR reports. Thank you, and over to you, Louisa. Thank you so much uh, for reminding us of the of the reach and the positive impact of our work and why it is critical that we read it, that we share it, and that we keep this document alive. So our next speaker, our keynote speaker, Ana de Oliveira from Cooperation Canada, will present now the new report and its key findings. Welcome, Ana, over to you. Thank you very much, Luisa, and thank you very much to all of you for joining this launch event. I'm very happy to be here. So similar to Shannon, I speak to you from Ottawa in Canada, recognizing this is the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Acknowledging the history and the contributions of Indigenous peoples is a small but important step in the path towards reconciliation everywhere. So next slide, please. Yes. Next one, please. There you go. So uh, as colleagues had mentioned, this is the sixth uh, edition of this report. And this time we analyzed the 42 VNR reports that were presented in 2021. Uh, and also considering that many among those were second and third time uh, reporters. Apart from the VNR reports, we also analyzed 17 civil society parallel reports that were related to those uh, VNR ones. Um, the progressing report is divided into four chapters that you see on the right that focus on governance, institutional mechanisms and engagement, policies implementing the 2030 agenda and VNR reporting practices. So today I'm going to highlight the 10 key messages coming from our analysis, including a comparative, um, uh, in comparative terms between different years whenever possible. So next slide, please. So this is our key message number one that says in terms of a whole of society approach, Fewer countries reported on the inclusion of non-state actors in governance arrangements for, impl for implementation than in previous years. Although more countries referred to formal processes for stakeholder engagement, there have been backslides in reporting on non-state actors um, engagement in the VNR process 
consultations to define national priorities and the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on stakeholder engagement. So next slide, please. Um, just putting some of that information in visual form. So this is available in the full report that I'm going to share uh, on the chat in, the, in a minute. So just to show some of the areas where the analysis showed increases, decreases, uh, and uh, one uh, steady uh, point around governance and engagement. So uh, we see, for example, a reverse in a so far upward trend in consulting non-state actors around VMI preparation. So next one, yes, thank you. So, um, Second finding, the VNR reports continue to be silent on shrinking civic space globally and ongoing attacks, attacks on human rights defenders and environmentalists. Conversely, several civil society reports highlight how this has been an issue. So my colleague, uh, Deidre de Burka from Foros will speak to this topic in more detail later in this event. Next, please, yes. Um, so fewer countries reported conducting baseline and gap assessments. So these baseline and gap assessments could be related to data, to policies or data and policies. Uh, also fewer countries reported selecting national priorities, integrating the SDGs into national policies and selecting national targets and indicators to inform SDGs implementation. Repeat reporters, those uh, presenting VMRs for the second or third time, they should still provide information on these matters and comply with the Secretary General's voluntary common reporting guidelines. So um, next one, please. Just uh, focusing a little bit more on the selection of national priorities. So this is a comparison of information from VNR reports from 2017 to 2021. And it shows that social outcomes, economy and environment have consistently been the topmost national priorities related to 2030 agenda implementation. Um, next one, please. So uh, there have been improvements in 2021 VNR reports, attention to the transformative principles of the 2030 agenda. I'll, I'll show uh, another chart um, on this in a minute. However, backslides were observed in relation to SDGs reporting. So on this, only 50%, only half, of the countries reporting in 2021 reported on all the 17 SDGs. And also there has been a more limited report on linkages between the SDGs. So just to show a bit more detail around the principles of the agenda, uh, this is a comparison between 2021 and 2020. And as we can see, the vast majority of countries refer to the leaving no one behind principle but not as much to the other transformative principles of the agenda, uh, despite some improvements in relation to the previous year. But this all shows that countries continue to focus more on the SDGs than on the transformative principles of the agenda. And next one, please. Okay. So, Reporting on linkages between the 2030 agenda and relevant international agreements showed mixed results, with most countries pointing to climate-related commitments, but having a more limited focus on agreements for delivery of effective international assistance. More VNR reports revealed an analysis of both domestic and foreign policies on their realization of the SDGs globally, which is a positive trend, even if uh, fewer countries focus on policy coherence for sustainable development as a guiding framework for 2030 agenda implementation. Uh, next one, please. And let's just skip this one. Please just go into the next. Yes, please. thank you. So this graph here shows um, that countries are most likely to link the 2030 agenda 
to the Paris Agreement on climate change. And on the other hand, very few of them seem to make the connection between realizing the SDGs and delivering effective international assistance. Um, however, and then, no, please back once, yeah. Thank you. So just a comment on the COVID-19 related uh, commitments, for example, the ACT uh, Accelerator or COVID or Gavi. So there's, a high, there's been a higher proportion of countries referring to those actions at the international level in comparison to the previous year. Thank you. Next one. Yes, thanks. So um, another finding uh, shows that there has been a positive trend in reporting on leaving no one behind with increases around the identification of left behind groups, the incorporation of the leaving no one behind principle in national policies and plans, and the impacts of COVID-19 on the most vulnerable. However, challenges remain in terms of data availability and level of detail and quality of information provided around leaving no one behind. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details here because my colleague Nas Mulet, uh, Action Aid, will speak to this topic in more detail later in this event. So next slide, please. Oh, okay, seven. So more countries reported on non-state actors' contributions towards 2030 agenda implementation with a continuous positive trend in terms of recognizing civil society's uh, role. So next one, please, just for you to, so, yeah. Uh, so this chart shows um, the main civil society contributions highlighted in Myanmar reports between 2017 and 2021. So civil society is involved in specific projects, in awareness raising, in multi-stakeholder initiatives. So I am highlighting this right now, uh, focusing on civil society, but the report goes into more detail in terms of partnerships. So as we read the VNR reports, not only civil society is acknowledged as a partner in SDGs implementation, but also academia, the private sector, parliamentarians, children and youth, and other stakeholders such as volunteers, for example. So many of those non-state actors are seen as uh, contributors and partners in implementation. Next one, please. Um, countries continue to consistently provide information on most aspects of 2030 agenda implementation. However, backslides have been observed on awareness raising activities and budgeting. So I'm not going to detail this too much, but our analysis covers many different aspects of implementation. So Please check the, the full report. I'm posting the link in the chat in a second. Uh, next slide. So a downward trend is emerging in terms of countries providing information on data availability and fewer countries reported on the use of unofficial data to complement information for VNR reports than in previous years. And similar, fewer countries reported on national, regional, and global follow-up and review processes. And on this, I just wanted to stress the importance of data to inform implementation efforts. So efforts must be grounded on evidence of what works, and they must be guided by a clear understanding of progress and bottlenecks. Also, national follow-up and review processes um, they are usually the, the point where most VNR reports lack to focus on, but this information is essential to ensure transparency and accountability, both at the national and the global levels. So let, uh, next one, please. It's my final key message. There have been declines in terms of reporting on most components of the Secretary General's Voluntary Common Reporting Guidelines compared to previous years. However, on the areas for, on the areas, excuse me, for which countries did report, most of them included all the information required. Next one, please, just to show uh, a figure. 
So this shows trends in reporting against the, the voluntary common reporting guidelines between 2020 and 2021. And it shows that uh, it shows the parts where declines in reporting have happened. Uh, in our report, uh, we also do a deeper dive in this kind of information. So we were able to, to see the extent to which each one of the reporting countries met the guidelines. So there is a, a, a even more comprehensive figure in the report. So next one, please. That's my final one. So thank you very much. Merci, gracias, and uh, obrigada. So these were the key messages. And of course, uh, any further details can be found in the full report. And I'm posting it in the chat right now. So we'll have access to the full report, um, the highlights um, in, in different languages, and also the policy briefs. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion and to hearing the other panelists. Back over to you, Luisa. Thank you very much, Anna, for your thoughtful presentation of the report and the key findings. Uh, with these key messages provided by our colleagues from Cooperation Canada, we can now comfortably move into our roundtable discussions. Rosario Garavito from the Millennials Movement, Peru, will moderate our first group discussion. Rosario, thank you so much for joining us today and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be here with you today. It's an honor to share this space with such amazing panelists, such amazing representatives in order to talk about more um, about the implementation of the SDGs and how this process can engage more people and how we can achieve and keep moving this agenda and the promise member states did back in 2015. Uh, it's an honor for me today to introduce our three uh, panelists that are gonna join me today uh, on the session. Uh, the first panelist is Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Shikhesi Anyangu from the UN Develop is the UN Development uh, from the UN Development Coordination Office. Also, we have uh, Mr. Luis Ortega, Minister of Economy, Planning and Development from the government of the Dominican Republic. We also have Mr. Carlos Barrospe Garcia and Patrick Gray from the Europe European Commission. Additionally, uh, we have Mr. Um, Guy Ronald Gumeli, Ministry from the Ministry of Economy, Planning and Territorial Development from the government of Cameroon, who through an uh, um, unforeseen uh, situation will not be able to join us today, and we is, is can, is sending his apologies as well for um, not being able to join the session. Um, so, with this introduction, I would like to uh, invite our our panelists to join me here on the on the session on the panel in order to start with this amazing conversation that we have prepared for you. Awesome. So we invite uh, Mr. Carlos Morospe Garcia to join us on the panel, Mr. Uh, Luis Ortega, and Shkisi Ani Aungu. Um, it's important also to mention that the dynamic of the panel today um, is going to be, we are going to have a segment with um, uh, uh, statements and presentations. Each of the panelists will have three minutes to make their presentation, and then we will move on with some questions that we have um, prepared for the panel. So we are going to invite, um, or following the program, we are going to invite Mr. Chikesi Ani Aniangu, uh, Chief, uh, Chief of the Partnership Section of the UN Development Coordination Office. To share with us his uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Rosario, and uh, greetings from New York colleagues and friends. Uh, 
uh, whichever part of the world you are. It's a pleasure to join you today and to listen to the presentations earlier on about the findings from uh, the, the report. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you and on behalf of the UN and especially the development uh, coordination system, uh, I bring you greetings uh, because this is the uh, UN department or agency that is responsible for working with the resident coordinators on the ground. We currently uh, supporting uh, 131 resident coordinator offices scattered around uh, 100, over 160 UN offices across the globe. Uh, and uh, the VNR has become a very, very important instrument and uh, process for us. And I'm being very uh, careful for the use of my words here, instruments and process, because we believe that it is critical uh, that uh, if the SDGs and the 2030 agenda is to be achieved, these processes has to be uh, such that involves everyone and most especially civil society. Uh, and I would go quickly to speak into a few things or a few comments, uh, issues that uh, has been shared or has been raised uh, from questions that I saw to, 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 to be more precise, the, the UN is very, very willing and ready to work with uh, civil society on these issues. Uh, the reform started in 2018 uh, and is a, is a process that is trying to look at the UN as, an, as a development agency that uh, is bringing all the UN agencies to be working together as one. Uh, it's still very much in its early stages. We're also drawing a lot of learnings from that process. And we'll, I would appeal that all hands to be on deck. But I, I want to use this opportunity to also highlight that there is a lot going on within the UN that unfortunately we've not been able to share. And uh, and I would say, and I, like I said, share to, with some of your colleagues, please don't wait for when the UN invites you uh, for you to go knocking on their doors. The UN is going through what we call a reform. And it's important that civil society begins to knock on this door at these early stages when the work is in progress to begin to find a niche for itself and begin to find places that uh, they can begin to intervene. A good example is this. The UN has introduced new planning processes. Uh, if, if you know, in every country right now, under the leadership of the resident coordinator, all the UN agencies coming together are supporting national governments in developing five-year plans that are supposed to be responding to uh, or build on the 17 SDG goals. So uh, those five-year plans, are in the process of doing the analysis and development of the plans, we see several avenues, several opportunities for civil society engagement, civil society involvement, civil society being part of the analysis and also bringing your evidence and even critical views uh, on board. But that is not happening as much as we want it to do and it's not a fault of yours it's also that the UN has not communicated this process adequately enough for uh, to, to the wider citizens to be able to, to to be part of it so there, there is a whole lot we all need to do to make these processes more consultative and uh, and, and also taking on board the the, the the whole of society approach so there's those two key sections of this planning process the first bit is what we call the common country analysis which basically is it's an internal un analysis of what are the issues that that drives uh, the sdgs and agenda 2030 in a country how do we make sure that we capture everybody's views and actions and that's a critical moment for the civil society to also be part of we we all know that the cooperation framework that finally emerges is an agreement between the UN and government, but it's also critical that civil society gets to know what is it that their government has signed on to with the UN vis-a-vis uh, -vis implementation of the SDGs in those countries. And I think it's critically key. If the UN is not making it available to civil society, it's important that you go as civil society and as citizens to ask the UN, what is it 
that you're doing in our country? What have you signed with our government to, to do on the SDGs? And that is the key purpose for even laying the foundations for what the VNR is all about, because you cannot be uh, voluntarily monitoring what you don't know. So you need to be able to know what is it that our government have signed on to, what is it that they have proposed they want to deliver on and, and hold both the UN and, 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 and other stakeholders uh, accountable to, to it. Uh, I'll pause at this point because I know that I don't want to take because I know there will be another round for question and answers. But uh, so I just wanted to give this introductory uh, opening remarks so that to say that we're very willing to work with the UN. Uh, not in all cases that we're wonderful uh, partners with civil society, I must put that out there, uh, but I think it's a relationship that we can all work on and cultivate as we move forward. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute and I look forward to another chance to also share some further insights and comments on the questions. Thank you and over. Thank you very much, Mr. Shikesi um, and I will. I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, but thank you. And thank you for this message, a strong message. And the civil society needs to be there and present and needs to be also demanding the work that needs to be done and articulating with the United Nations in order to move forward this global effort to achieve the SDGs or to keep moving the agenda. Thank you very much. So now we are going to the second presentation. We have three minutes for this. We are gonna uh, hear now Mr. Luis Ortega as his Ministry of Economy, uh, Planning and Development uh, from the government of the Dominican Republic. Uh, she's responsible for the Sustainable Development Department on the Ministry of Economy, Planning and Development from the government of the Dominican Republic. My apologies for that. Uh, Mr. Ms. Ortega, you are welcome to join us in this panel. Thank Buenos you. Días. Buenos días, Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches, según corresponda a los diferentes espacios en que están todos los que nos acompañan en este espacio digital. Es para mi representación del Ministerio de Economía, Planificación y Desarrollo un gran honor compartir con ustedes algunas ideas del proceso y el resultado obtenido con la preparación de el informe nacional voluntario, el segundo informe nacional voluntario, eh, ya que República Dominicana, desde el momento en que suscribió, se suscribió el, a la Agenda 2030 en el 2015, cinco meses después, ya estaba a través de una ordenanza del decreto del presidente de la República, organizando el espacio de gobernanza para la implementación de la estrategia global ese instrumento formidable que permite visualizar eh, problemas estructurales, problemas coyunturales y eh, eh, señalar un camino para eh, mejoras rápidas con gran participación. Eh, la República Dominicana, ah, como dije hace un momentito, ha, ha participado ya en el foro político de alto nivel de las Naciones Unidas con la presentación de dos informes. Uno fue en el 2018 no fue el año pasado que recoge, que recoge toda la información del año 2020. Eh, para la preparación de esos dos informes, sobre todo el último, ya la República Dominicana tenía antecedentes de procesos de formulación de su Estrategia Nacional de Desarrollo, por un lado, y además de los informes anuales y uno quinquenal, que había realizado de una estrategia que fue elaborado con una amplia participación de los sectores representativos de la sociedad dominicana que se aprobó mediante ley en el año 2012 y que ha tenido año tras año un seguimiento y unos informes normales. Por consiguiente, cuando decidimos participar en el primer, eh, la primera preparación del informe voluntariado, teníamos una sociedad ya eh, preparada con amplia participación y hábito y deseo y entusiasmo de aportar. Por eso, eh, en la gobernanza que se estructuró para la implementación, que, que coincide precisamente con los ejes fundamentales de la Estrategia Nacional de Desarrollo, están presentes el sector privado, el sector público, la sociedad civil, las academias, lo, las autoridades municipales, y todos ellos participaron en la formulación, en el levantamiento de información de 
que fue, con el que fue posible eh, formular el segundo informe nacional voluntario. Eh, esa metodología, por consiguiente, fue ampliamente participativa, multiactor, con una estructura de gobernanza que de la implementación, pero que además hizo uso de otros espacios que ya existían y por consiguiente fue muy rico la, toda la, la, expo, la participación y los aportes que hicieron los diferentes actores. Metodológicamente se hizo un análisis de estadística oficial, de análisis de documentos, se validaron y complementaron información recogida por parte de las subcomisiones. Las subcomisiones son precisamente los espacios de la gobernanza, hay cuatro, su comisión de personas, su comisión de prosperidad, su comisión de planeta y su comisión de, de institucionalidad. Esta última coincide con lo que son los ODS 16 y 17 de, de la Agenda 2030. Para la conformación de, de, del informe se desarrollaron seis consultas con actores clave para la Agenda 2030 en el país representando a los diferentes sectores que hace un momentito mencioné. En su contenido, el informe tiene y presenta el nivel de avance hacia objetivos y metas de los ODS, que como todos ustedes saben, eh, anualmente las Naciones Unidas define objetivo ODS prioritario para este informe 2021, que recoge información del 2020, se definieron nueve objetivos eh, prioritarios, República Dominicana, adicionó para hacer el análisis uno por la gran importancia que tiene para nuestro país, lo que es el sector agua limpia y saneamiento para la persona. En su contenido, además de ese nivel de avance, incluye cuestiones estructurales y temas emergentes, medios de implementación, apropiación e incorporación de los ODS a la planificación nacional. Y esta última parte es importante precisarla, porque precisamente lo, los informes han sido un instrumento de mucha utilidad para acercar los instrumentos nacionales con la Agenda 2030 e integrarlo a los instrumentos nacionales tal y cual hace el mandato en sí de la propia Agenda, de que sean los países que a través de sus instrumentos nacionales implementen eh, los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Ahí, eh, a partir de, eso, de ese último informe, el segundo informe que presentamos, hay una información muy rica porque inclusive la coyuntura en que se levantó eh, plena pandemia obligó a desarrollar y a innovar formas de recoger y de analizar información porque la mayoría de las personas estaban en sus hogares, pero inclusive eso fue provechoso porque eh, se logró integrar a más personas durante más tiempo por el propio hecho de estar encerrado en la casa y se hizo un... Una, un se utilizó muy bien todas las herramientas digitales y nada, aunque la pandemia estaba y estábamos como estábamos todo en el mundo, era como si no para fines de la formulación del informe dado el entusiasmo y la participación y la estructura que existía de gobernanza bien definida y los roles que cada quien sabía que, que te debía cumplir fue muy fácil. Quiero eh, eh, por último, ya que se me ha agotado el tiempo, referirme a lo de Rosario Díaz Garavito cuando habló de... de del rol de la sociedad civil para el, en nuestra experiencia en, fue muy rica y enriquecedora de la sociedad civil de los aportes que hace, porque inclusive en cualquier parte del mundo desde los espacios gubernamentales a veces, no siempre, en pocas ocasiones eh, se nos mete una ceguera y vemos algunos indicadores sesgados y alguien siempre debe estar en la mesa para decir, hey, se están un poco desviando porque lo que nosotros tenemos y entonces eso ha ayudado a establecer el diálogo y a sacar realmente informe transparente, sólido, robusto, que sirva de instrumento precisamente para avanzar mejor tal como lo plantea la, la Agenda 2030. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Oh, my Spanish came. <laughs> so thank you very much, Mr. Luis Ortega, for these amazing remarks and for sharing this great experience of articulation and for recognizing the work of civil society, but also uh, how good partners they can be and how much they can enrich the process. Thank you very much. In order to follow up with the program, we are going to now invite Mr. Carlos Ross Garcia and Patrick Gray from the European Commission for the three minutes uh, first statement. And then we will continue with the questions and answers in order to extend a little bit more this conversation. Thank you very much. So we have now um, 
Mr. Carlos Berroste Garcia. He's a senior expert, head of the sector of sustainable development, global goals dimension, PGEINTPA from the European Commission. Welcome, and we are very eager to also learn and hear from you. Uh, thank you very much, Forus, uh, for the invitation. Muchas gracias, Rosario, for the presentation. Uh, I understand the, the intervention of my colleague Patrick Rabe will take part in the second panel on civil society, where he is an expert. Uh, just to mention, DG Impa is the Director General for International Partnerships, uh, which is, is in charge of development cooperation. So I just wanted to start by saying that the, the EU is strongly committed to the implementation of SDGs. We also took uh, action uh, in the months that followed. Uh, the SDGs are at the core of what we do internally and externally, and this is visible in a uh, number of, of critical documents in the EU. Uh, we have a new um, college of commissioners with President von der Leyen since the end of 2019. And uh, the first thing she did in the mission letter to each commissioner each of them says you have to implement SDGs in your area and collectively all the commission will be in charge and all the annual uh, work programs of the commission refer to the SDGs. We can find it in the leading initiatives we have been taken like the Green Deal response to COVID, et cetera. And when I speak uh, now more broadly, the whole EU and I'm bringing in the member states and the parliament are, are strongly behind this. Uh, with this new college of uh, President von der Leyen, uh, there was a document in 2020, and I hope I can share uh, after the presentation uh, uh, for circulation this information called Delivering on the SDGs. Uh, the, basically, one year ago, she made very clear this whole of commission approach. And it includes uh, the first steps, which was finalized a few, a few months ago to enhance our governance in terms of the revisions of our rules, how to make policies, how to make legislation with a new role to the SDGs is the so-called better regulation framework, I understand I can come back later to such things. On the external side, which is where I'm working, uh, since 2017, we made a new European consensus on development, the European Commission, the Parliament, the Member States, putting the SDGs at the center of our approaches and our partnerships. Of course, as we heard from the UN colleague, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic has been uh, uh, drop, uh, has uh, affected the implementation of the SDGs, but it also, we know this is a compass out of the crisis because of the need to invest sustainably and uh, uh, given the interlinkages, which is at the center of the SDGs. I, I want to say that in our action, we have really integrated in our systems and tools. So everything we do has to be designed to contribute to the SDGs and to report on the SDGs. Many of this machinery will come gradually into place. But for instance, we have adopted uh, last year a new financial instrument to support partner countries. And we have just made for each country a so-called uh, multi-annual uh, action program. And in each of them, we say which SDGs we will support. We have developed an electronic tool to help colleagues to do this, which is uh, available to stakeholders. I will try to, to circulate information later about this. Uh, but this instrument that I said is 80 billion for the next seven years is only from the EU institutions budget. But now we want to think as Team Europe with the EU member states and with the financial institutions where we have already mobilized last year to help out of the pandemic 46 billion. This includes uh, 3 billion support to COVAX for vaccines. Uh, I will come back uh, in details, but we have achieved to increase uh, the proportion of uh, uh, GNI for ODA in times of crisis. Uh, before uh, finishing this uh, first intervention, understanding I can come back on a couple of points. I wanted to say something which is a bit premature, but uh, it's a good occasion to share it with you. We are really interested in all the work of photos and the organizations behind are doing on VNRs and the stakeholder involvement. And uh, in fact, we are starting to prepare the concept of a European uh, voluntary review at the high level political forum next year. As you know, the EU is full participant to the HLPF, uh, which would be an occasion to show everything we're doing internally and externally and the uh, EU member states and uh, are supporting strongly the concept. So once our internal process is, uh, is uh, clear, I will come back, we will outreach about this, but uh, I just wanted to flag up that we are working with that idea in mind. Uh, so ready for a discussion, I have more things to say, but I think for the first intervention, that should be it. Thank you very much.
thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Carlos Barras, for your input. And now we are moving forward to the next segment of this panel. We have some questions we have prepared for the different panelists, and we will be sharing them, sharing uh, the questions with them. So first, we are going to start with Mr. Um, with Mr. Uh, Chick Casey, and I will. La, uh, the question is the following. Okay, could you talk a bit more about the work of the UNDCO where the 2030 agenda is concerned and how it supports the national and global efforts for sustainable development? Thank you, Thank you. very much. Thank you again, Rosario. And um, quickly, uh, like I highlighted in my opening remarks, uh, the UN embarked on the reforms uh, in late 2018. And, uh, and that is a reform of uh, the UN development system uh, by introducing an empowered, a lot more empowered resident coordinator who online before is a lot more free here now to do coordination, development coordination, to engage on advocacy issues. And this is the number one representative of the UN in every country. Like I said earlier on, there are 131 of them uh, in 160 plus countries. Uh, secondly, they have, unlike before, they now have five core staff members who are responsible from on issues around economic policy analysis, partnership and uh, development finance support data uh, and, and all that. So he has core new staff, which was not the case before. And this is to enable this uh, UN offices to deliver better on the SDGs. Now, like I mentioned, what is the business of the UN at the moment in every country? It is the delivery of Agenda 2030 or the SDGs. That is the primary responsibility or role of the UN. And in, in order to do this, a new planning process was introduced, a five-year plan, which develops a five-year plan, uh, which is called the, uh, com, uh, the uh, cooperation frameworks, which is signed between the UN or the UN agencies and the national government. Uh, and I had highlighted the process of developing this. There's a first phase of analysis, which I think civil society should and should be playing a critical role if, if they are not already. Uh, and, I, and then before the final agreement of what needs to be done is done by, between government and, and the UN. But more importantly, once this is signed, because it's an agreement between the UN and national government, so civil society involvement is very limited. But once that is done, it is critically important for civil society to begin to ask the UN, what is it that you've signed to do in, in relation to delivering SDGs in our country for the next five years? they are at liberty to share that with you. It's your right to know what the UN is doing in your respective countries for the next five years, all in the lead to, 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 to implement and, uh, uh, the, the SDGs. And that is the basis upon which you can now begin to hold them accountable, to monitor, to, to do your voluntary national uh, reviews, to know if, are they on target? Are they not on target? What is it that is missing? How much have they involved the whole of society? Uh, and a good example also of this coordinated approach of responding to national issues, emergencies, and SDG-related uh, targets is the, is the COVID response and the UN's call for continuous call for vaccine equity, which is a good example of how the coordination is happening. It is one thing for the UN to make this coordination calls. It's another thing for national governments to implement it. And, and, I, want, and I think I want you guys to understand that the UN, in as much as it has a big name, it's closer to power and policy. It also has its own handicaps because we, we cannot implement what a government does not want. And, and that is something that we, we are civil society, the citizens of that country need to step in and hold their governments a lot more accountable and also push their agendas. So in addition to VNR, there is the annual program reviews which the UN carries out. The program reviews are basically internal annual reviews where they bring in different stakeholders. And, I, and I've said this over and over again, it's a wonderful opportunity for civil society to demand to be part of that annual review, to say, we want to know 
what is it that has worked? What is it that you guys are planning to do? So annually, and, and, and a plan is a plan. Things might happen. There might be emergency situations that require the plan to change. And I think that's where the, 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 the civil society needs to become a lot more involved, a lot more engaged. And like I said earlier on, yes, the UN has not done wonderfully well. We're pushing resident coordinators and the UN agencies on the ground now to be more responsive, to be more open, to be more consultative and involve a lot more of different stakeholders in the process of the reviews, in the process of the planning and the analysis. And uh, that's why we'll, in the past two years, we've been working more closely with, with your various agencies and platforms and networks to see how we infuse and get more civil society uh, actors and networks, especially at the national level, a lot more involved in the business of planning and program implementation on the ground of the United Nations. I'll, I'll pause at this point and, and hear the other questions. Over to you. Thank you very much for this input and very important the process. Actually, remember July is a key moment in our, for all civil society and also for governments where we present these national volunteering reviews. So thank you very much for your, for your response. Now we are moving forward with um, Mr. Luis Ortega, Mr. Luis Ortega from, uh, uh, from the government of Dominican Republic. So the question is the following. The Dominican Republic presented a second BNR report in 2021. Can you speak a little bit more on the experience in the country? Uh, we know that you have mentioned a lot of details uh, during your uh, first presentation, but can you share some key um, some key inputs as well on how this process took place at a national level? Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Ortega, Mr. Luis, are you in the session? Okay, so by sí, the time... Bueno, sí, oh. ahora estoy awesome. totalmente presente. Eh, de decía, eh, eh, como dije en mi exposición de hace unos minutos, el hecho de que República Dominicana organizara rápidamente en el 2016 su espacio de gobernanza y la experiencia anterior en, en las consultas para la Estrategia Nacional de Desarrollo, se hizo posible que al interior del gobierno se articularan eh, equipos de trabajo que respondieron rápidamente a proveer los insumos y a participar en los primeros borradores, en el análisis de las informaciones estadísticas, etc. Eh, debo resaltar que en esa estructura de gobernanza, en el primer decreto emitido en febrero del 2016, se habían incorporado 24 representantes institucionales más cuatro de la sociedad civil y algunos del sector privado. Sin embargo, dado el entusiasmo y las solicitudes desde la sociedad civil, fue necesario ampliar y emitir otro decreto para incorporar a muchas más organizaciones, al diálogo y a las mesas de trabajo técnica que a la vez se organizaron al interior de los seis espacios, cuatro subcomisiones y dos comités, uno de estadística y otro de financiamiento que se realizó. Por consiguiente, de manera este, formal, en la estructura de gobernanza, habían de más de la mitad de los participantes en el diálogo periódico que se hace en las subcomisiones, en los espacios de diálogo y discusión, más de la mitad era representante del sector, de la sociedad civil, de las academias y del sector privado. Y como dijimos hace un momentito, sus aportes son fenomenales, porque evidentemente la integración de múltiples actores, el enfoque de uno o varios problemas es mucho más rico que la participación de un solo actor con una sola visión con un solo en el levantamiento de la información hay y la participación de sectores naturalmente hay diferencia y hubo diferencia en los aportes el propio hecho de la coyuntura en que nos encontramos para el segundo informe eh, fue beneficioso hace un momentico para comunicarnos entre sí en, entre los sectores sin embargo los sectores en su respectivo espacio distribuidos en el 
en todo el territorio nacional tenían a su vez algunas limitantes para, de movilidad. Y por consiguiente, en esa parte no le fue posible para este segundo informe hacer lo que se hizo para el primero. A la vez, llegar a más actores que no estaban involucrados en la subcomisión para levantar de manera presencial, algunos hay que llegar de manera presencial, dada las limitaciones que algunos de los sectores que tienen mucho que aportar y que no se pueden quedar atrás, eh, debían ser consultados. Sin embargo, es, eh, las, las, los, los actores de la sociedad civil y de los demás sectores de la academia se la ingeniaron y de alguna manera se comunicaron y levantaron la información suficiente. Ese es un paso muy importante en cualquier informe nacional voluntario y en cualquier otro informe de rendición de cuenta que se tenga de un instrumento de planificación nacional. Puesto que sería extremadamente fácil, pero muy punto ciego, elaborar un informe desde un escritorio con un grupo de técnicos, en donde uno puede inventar cualquier cosa, y sin embargo no va a reflejar lo que realmente está sucediendo en la sociedad, el punto de vista de los sectores interesados en aspectos que no siempre están interesados sectores, que están eh, conduciendo los procesos políticos, que además tienen otros intereses, pero que se conjuntan. Por eso la participación horizontal en eh, el diálogo, el diálogo, el, el hablar, pero el escucharse y tomar las notas correspondientes de los planteamientos es un, pacto, un, un paso esencial en cualquier informe de rendición de cuentas. De, 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 no hacerlo así, sencillamente... Eh, podría equivaler a escribir muy bonitos libros, en una falta de respeto a la poesía, algunos dicen hacer poesía técnica, ¿verdad? pero es un, una falta de respeto a la poesía porque la poesía es muy bella también. Eh, podríamos decir hacer anaqueles y libros. Por tanto, esa es una parte que cada, que cada día inclusive se hace más evidente en el mundo, en el, en el mundo entero. Eh, el otro aspecto que quiero señalar es que... Eh, estamos un poco con el tiempo porque tenemos que continuar con el programa y tenemos una pregunta más para nuestro último panelista. Bien. Te agradecemos muchísimo por este mensaje y también por esta disposición de trabajar con la sociedad civil y compartirnos esa experiencia que sirve como una buena práctica para futuros ejercicios nacionales y esperamos que los gobiernos y la sociedad civil que nos está yendo en este momento pueda tomar esa experiencia como referencia también para tener un proceso mucho más inclusivo. I'm sorry, I didn't speak in Spanish. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Ortega. We are moving forward with our next panelist. We are short on time, but thank you very much for your inputs, but also for uh, inviting us uh, to be more inclusive. So I hope this great experience is follow up and a study and include as an approach for the next exercises at the national level. So thank you very much. We go now with our last question. So we have short Gracias time. Gracias a por la invitación. Gracias. Thank you. And now we are going to call Mr. Carlos Borrospe Garcia from the European um, Union. And I want to, uh, for the European Commission representative, and I want to ask this question. Could you speak a bit more about how the EU is implementing internally the SDGs, including in its concrete approach to policy making, and how it promotes the SDGs implementation externally through the international partnerships? We thank you very much for your response, um, and we also rem remember you about the time constraints. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm trying to look at the, in parallel to questions from the panel, like one colleague saying that climate becomes very central in communication by the EU. I recognize this is an issue. It's not only in the EU. It is a bit of a pity that it seems nearly that climate and SDGs should compete, whereas sustainable development should be a whole. But this is certainly something to be looked at. But it's very good that you asked me on the governance. I'm going to put actually in the chat as I speak a link that may be of interest to colleagues. Uh, because um, a, a very important modification made, which could have an influence, I saw questions from uh, Kim Christiansen about what about a real policy change, etc. Something is going to happen in, now, because at the end of November, we adopted the revision of the better regulation framework. What is this? It's a big document of 600 pages saying to every commission official, how do you do legislation? How do you do legislative proposals, impact assessments? If you go there, I'm going to send it, you will find uh, in this document about more than 200 references to SDGs. Uh, there's section 
18 and 19, which are really worth a look if you're interested. From now, it's going to be everybody in the commission has to look very concretely in its impact assessments having regard to indicators, how it contributes to the SDGs. This must be presented in the legislative proposals in evaluations. So it is really a big change that should bring in what we all try to get, which is policy coherence for uh, sustainable uh, development. And uh, we go in this direction. Of course, with shortcomings, I've seen comments of leaving on behind. There's a number of areas we still need to, to do it better. But I think in terms of governance and how we work, this is really an important piece. Uh, on the external thing that you asked me, just a couple of messages, aware of time. We are moving now as Team Europe, as I said, and we are doing 150 initiatives with our member states, uh, notably to help COVID. Just to mention one, which we launched in the Africa uh, Union Summit and the EU, with the EU uh, some days ago, is a 1 billion initiative to support African to uh, enhance the vaccine and medicine manufacturing capacity in Africa. Uh, we are also promoting, and this was also launched in the Africa Summit, uh, something called Global Gateway Partnerships. We aim to support sustainable connectivity aligned with the SDGs and with the Paris Agreement. And uh, the last point I wanted to mention on VNRs, because it's the issue today, the EU is an active supporter with the United Nations of workshops to promote VNRs. In April, we're going to support uh, the UN, UNDESA, to have a seminar in Botswana. Uh, uh, and today, actually, I got uh, information from the colleagues in Botswana where the CSO platform is called the uh, Bocon NGO asked to be more involved at today's meeting uh, in the National Steering Committee on the SDGs in Botswana. So it is something we are very uh, attached to, and that's why we are very keen uh, to see all the work being done by polls and organizations. But on the relation with civil society, as I mentioned, my colleague Patrick Rabe will intervene in the second panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Carlos Borospe. And this is amazing news. I am talking from civil society as well, and I'm, I look forward to see more of these workshops for these uh, national exercises happening in other countries. Um, it, it, I guess it will be a great contribution for civil society and for the efforts that different stakeholders are putting into this global commitment to leave no one behind by 2030. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you for sharing the document. I'm pretty sure and many people it's already uh, accessing to it and commenting already that it's a great piece of work. So thank you, Mr. Carlos Rosco. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for joining this panel. And now in order to continue the program, I give the floor to the team of Horus so they can continue with the facilitation of the process. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Chikesi Aniangu, Mr. Carlos Borospe, and Luis Ortega. Thank you for your work, for your commitment, and for bearing with us on this great process. So see you soon. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Rosario, and your fellow panelists for the lively discussion on CSO contributions to and commitment to collaboration across sectors for progressing national SDGs implementation. Thank you and gracias. Now, I want to offer a warm welcome to Lilei Chao from Save the Children. Lilei will take us through the second roundtable discussion in our webinar today. So thank you very much. Uh, Lilay, for joining us and to your panelists, and uh, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, the launch of this uh, important report. My name is Lily, and I'll be moderating the second roundtable, which really brings together some of the key themes that we are seeing uh, from civil society perspective in the VNRs. Um, today, our panel consists of three speakers. The first is uh, Ms. Deirdre De Bruca, who is the Advocacy Coordinator for Forests, and she's going to be presenting the findings on uh, civic space. Um, in the interest of time, Deirdre, let over to you. And can I just remind the panelists, please, if you can um, limit your interventions to about three to four minutes, that would be fantastic. Thank you. 
Thanks, Lily, and hello, everybody. My name is Deirdre de Burka. I'm the Advocacy Coordinator with Forus, and as you know, we're a global civil society network, and we focus our advocacy work largely on promoting an enabling environment for civil society everywhere. So we've developed a policy brief on civic space using the raw data provided by the Progressing Reports research team and drawn from its analysis of the 2021 VNRs. So I will present civic space and 2021 VNR findings as briefly as possible, but I would encourage you to read the policy brief and I'd ask my colleague Thomas to put a link to this policy brief in the chat box now. So the key findings of the policy brief are as follows. Firstly, first finding, an enabling environment and open civic space are essential conditions for the effective engagement of non-state actors, including civil society, in SDG implementation. So in the 2021 VNRs, some countries did report on efforts to create a more enabling environment through policies that support multi-stakeholder engagement in 2030 agenda implementation. So these countries included Afghanistan, Bhutan, Denmark, Germany, Indonesia, Japan, Laos, Malaysia, Namibia, Norway, Sierra Leone, and Thailand. However, many CSOs also reported significant barriers and challenges faced in trying to engage with SDG implementation in their countries, including closed or closing civic space. Next slide, please. So the second finding, consistent with the VNRs of previous years, the 2021 VNRs were largely silent on the issue of shrinking civic space for civil society, even though this is now a clearly established global trend. So only one of the 42 VNR reports presented in 2021 recognized the challenge of shrinking civic space and its consequences for civil society. And that was Norway's VNR that mentioned it. According to the Civicus Monitor, which examines the status of civic space around the world, civic space for 62% of the countries that presented VNRs to the UN High Level Political Forum in 2021 is characterized either as obstructed, repressed or closed. And only 26% of the reporting countries last year had an open status when it came to safeguarding civic space. The third finding, next slide please, sorry. The third finding was that civil society shadow and parallel reports provide important information on how civic space has been closed in different countries, but these reports have no status in official VNR review processes at national, regional or international levels. So CSO shadow and spotlight reports do provide additional and sometimes contradictory information in relation to country-led SDG implementation, but the perspectives and the information brought forward by non-state stakeholders such as CSOs provide a much broader view on the extent to which and how effectively SDG implementation is being carried out at the national level. And the fact that so much information being provided in these reports by civil society on closing civic space is being constantly overlooked by VNR reports is a matter of grave concern and must be addressed. Next slide, please. So the policy brief makes a series of recommendations and I'm going to run very quickly through them. Firstly, for the international community, the recommendations are firstly agreed that SDG 16 will be reviewed annually by the UN High Level Political Forum to give more regular political attention to civic space and human rights issues. Secondly, adopt a broader range and that means structural and process oriented civic space indicators as well as the outcome oriented indicators that are there at the moment. Thirdly, develop a new SDG 17 related indicator, and this would measure multi-stakeholder engagement in SDG implementation and would help to operationalize SDG 17's commitment to supporting multi-stakeholder partnerships. Another um, recommendation is to establish a global civic space observatory, and we're calling on international donors, both public and private, to fund a new independent global civil spa civic space observatory connected to regional hubs to monitor and collect data on the status of civic space in countries around the world. And this data which should be made publicly available and should inform discussions on civic space within key international fora, such as the UN High Level Political Forum, COP climate summits, and so on. Another recommendation is to provide flexible funding to support the operation of CSOs in contexts of closed or closing civic space. And finally, and this is important because it's something quite new, to include the assessment of civic space in investor 
risk assessment instruments. So an assessment of civic space should be included as a key element of mainstream investor risk assessment approaches and any associated rating scales used by investors to assess potential risks in countries in which private companies or financial institutions are considering to invest. Finally, the recommendations for national governments, just three simple ones. Firstly, create national legal, regulatory and policy frameworks for multi-stakeholder engagement. These are necessary if we're to you know, see uh, multiple stakeholders being engaged with SDG implementation. Secondly, report on civic space issues in VNRs submitted to the UN High Level Political Forum. And we need progressive governments there to take the lead on that. And thirdly, engage in peer exchange with other governments to share good practices on civic space issues. Thank you for your attention and I will hand back to the moderator again. Over to you, Lily. I'm still, Thank but I'm you, not Jim. talking. Okay. Uh -huh. You wanted to say something? I know yeah, it wasn't it's easy to, um, to to wrap all of that imp um, imp information up in, in such a short period of time. Just to say, again, that these policy briefs are an innovation and they can be used um, to look as a snapshot of all uh, these key issues. And I would urge you to have a look at them, use them for your advocacy purposes. The next um, presentation is going to focus again on, on, on a very important uh, theme. And we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated and changed in some cases patterns of inequality uh, around the world. And he, today we're going to hear from Mr. Nazmul Asan from Action Aid, who joins us from Bangladesh. And he's the manager of Young People Action Aid Bangladesh. Thank you. Nazmul, Thank you. over to you. Thank you, Lily. Thank you for inviting me to speak in this moment. Um, thank you very much. In a sense, let's say, you know, there is a discussion in our civil society space in Bangladesh. This actually, what is the objective of Vienna? Um, uh, whether the accountability aspect is there or it is something, you know, sometimes government like to uh, project, showcase their kind of progress in the uh, UN or with the international forum. So that's a huge critic, you know, without the having the uh, that accountability aspects, you know, whether, where we are holding the government accountable. Uh, so it, it sometimes become very kind of loose document to actually uh, to follow, to practice and to discuss on that. So uh, as, we, as we, you ask the question to me in terms of the COVID and the Helena Bay aspect, and you know, this is the Bangladesh conducted the last Vienna, submitted the last Vienna report in 2022, but yeah, during the COVID time and in fact, and and there was a lot of discussion how the government is also including the civil society, the marginalized group, uh, the living one behind group aspects in the reports and the, in the consultation. So usually the, the you know government has the you know the two reasons say that because of the COVID we cannot reaching out to the uh, marginalized group uh, as we are expecting you know should be included in the in the report kind of things and. The data is actually a big problem for us, you know. So what are the data is being used by the government? So mostly the government that generated data and those data is being you know, developed probably the three to four years back. And and the and, and in most cases we see the government doesn't accept the civil society data. And even we have seen that in many cases, the in the in the in the context of COVID, you know, the people how how being they're being suffered in terms of their, you know. Um, the, their livelihood, their income, their in the medical kind of issues, and the and also the vaccine issues at the initial level. But now it is, it is I think, government managed well after what the vaccine issues. However, uh, as we said, with the COVID has increased the rate of poverty in the whole country. So, uh, how the the government is is going to take over these uh, these issues? You know, in terms of achieving this disease after you know next next few years. Um, in, in 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 with respect to the you know. Uh, rights of the girls, children, and young people. So we have seen the uh, you know the child marriage has increased to a greater great extent. So because of the you know social and mental pressure and and, and the pressure from the family, we have seen the lots of gender-based violence has been taking place. And you know there are many cases are being making headlines on the newspapers. So so that was the kind of actually you know lots of you know kind of issues as over there. And in 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 terms of the you know participation, actually. Uh, we see this is there is some few invited space that government is opening for the civil society but all non state actors but you will not see the um the civil society has a lot of kind of a stake on the whole discussion so main cases you know they are the uh, kind of sent they are taking the central role in terms of the preparing the reports and the generating the data but you know 
so you will see there are very little the space where civil society actually can push them um, as push them for you know uh, for claiming their rights or you know giving giving them the data they are generating by their own networks. So in in cases in some cases this is the discussion. Yeah, yeah sorry, I'm I'm, sorry, I'm concluding. No, I'm concluding. Thank you. So in in in, in that aspect, I see you know the COVID actually uh, imposed a lot of kind of um uh, kind of i, I think said uh, risk in terms of achieving the um sdg so i think the the countries and the other civil society stakeholders should be giving a uh, lots of emphasis on that how how actually they can address the issues of covid and uh, living no behind group in the upcoming days thank you very much lily Thank you, Nazmal, indeed, for presenting uh, your insights into the process in, in Bangladesh. And, and, you know, the VNRs are a report at the end of the day, but they are so much more than a report. They are also a process, and the more inclusive the process in general, the stronger the report. We will next um, hear from Mr. Patrick Rabe from uh, the European Commission, and indeed one of the most, perhaps, um, the transformative principle of the 2030 agenda was in how uh, it envisioned a, a whole of society approach. So, Mr. Uh, Rabi, we would love to hear your thoughts on how we can cooperate and work together, um, you know, governments and civil society or the commission and civil society. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lily, and uh, thank you very much to Forus for inviting me to, to speak uh, here today. Uh, so Carlos already introduced me as the expert on civil society. I'm not sure. It's a very broad area. Uh, I lead a team uh, that uh, deal with the relations that we have with civil society, consultations with civil society through a policy forum on development, which we have, and then who also try to um, uh, support civil society through uh, through uh, uh, through a thematic program. So I don't have a PowerPoint, but I just like to say a few words, uh, starting with the the policy that is at the basis of what we try to to do. And first of all, in that is very much that uh, we see civil society as development actors in their own right, and we try to support their engagement to contribute to democratic processes as well as to achieve uh, better development outcomes. So that's our starting point. And we have in that uh, three uh, priorities, you can call them. The first is uh, to help protect or to strengthen uh, the enabling environment, protecting the, the civil society space. Uh, the second is to support participation, the, the, the concrete participation of civil society in decision making. And the third priority is to support civil society in their capacity, in their, in their um, ability to act and to act as, as influencers, but also to act as, as parties to development cooperation. Uh, and these policy priorities or objectives has, have been around with us for quite some time now, since 2012, when we, when we had a major policy overhaul of this area. Uh, but it's been adapted to the Agenda 2030 and to the SDGs. It's been reconfirmed in, and Carlos mentioned it, the new European Consensus on Development. And luckily, uh, these things are very well reflected in the DAC, in the OECD DAC recommendation on civil society engagement from uh, 2021. Uh, we've also updated this a little bit in preparing our new financial instruments. Um, we've taken into account particularly the developments in the early stages of the pandemic, where we realized, including thanks to organizations like Forus, that indeed the civic space was, was shrinking. And so you might know that uh, the EU, the Commission, we have a development program which uh, is big and which is often quite uh, complicated, but it has the advantage of being predictable and long term. So our funding come in in seven year batches. And we've just been through the process of negotiating with our EU member states and our parliament, an instrument called Global Europe or the for 2021. Uh, to 2027. 
And this program is, is covering all of our uh, cooperation with Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And uh, it is basically a geographic program. 75% of it will be allocated to the country level. And then a quarter will be uh, allocated to certain thematic issues. And of those thematic issues, uh, our support for CSOs is one. Uh, and this CSO thematic program, which we are just about to launch, is uh, tiny in comparison to the 80 billion overall program uh, with its 1.5 billion, but it's still very important. 75% of that will go to the country level, so will be dealt with by our delegations at the country level, and 25% will be dealt with by headquarters. Uh, and what are we trying to achieve uh, with this program? Well, at the country level, we're trying to go as local as possible. That's one of our responses and one of the updates that we have done to our policy. We're trying specifically to focus on women and youth organizations. And of course, we're trying then to continue to focus on these three priority areas that I mentioned um, within the context of achieving the SDGs. So. Uh, uh, so those sort of sector objectives are still relevant in accordance to the priorities set at the country level. Um, and at the global level, we will be seeking to support uh, umbrella organizations that work uh, through synergies with other or through their membership or constituencies to achieve these three priorities that I mentioned. And um, in that we're also trying to, sorry, uh, also trying to set up a system for monitoring and uh, an engagement system for civic space. As I said, we've realized that civil society space is shrinking and that we, we need to do more uh, in that area. And for that, this forest report is indeed very helpful. So that was a little bit on the financing and the funding, but I think at the basis, the most important thing is the policy and the political role that the EU is playing in countries. And for that, I'd like to mention the EU roadmaps for engagement with civil society organizations. These roadmaps are uh, documents, strategies that our EU delegations draw up together with EU member states for uh, engaging with civil society in the countries. Um, and the second thing I'd like to mention, which is important for, for how we achieve on civil society is that of course, as I said, the civil society specific program is very small. So the important thing is really to mainstream the inclusion of civil society in all the other geographic and thematic areas that we work in. And then just to finish off uh, with what we're working on now, and that is trying to see how can we follow up on, these, on this funding? How can we see uh, whether progress is being made? And so we're working on indicators and we're working on trying to find targets although that is rather complicated uh, to look at uh, sort of the number of partner countries where the political leadership recognizes the value of and enables the participation of civil society in policy making processes and then having different baseline years and and do studies to compare if we are if we are achieving any progress so there a little overview of our policy and of our funding program and what we are uh, working on for the moment um thank you thank you very much patrick um and uh, i think in the interest of time because we are running a little bit late i'm going to ask one question to all three, uh, the, the one question um, to all three of our panelists, if you could give your interventions and if, uh, just a reminder to, to keep it succinct. Um, so the question that I have for all three um, is what can different stakeholders, including international and regional organizations, governments, CSOs, other stakeholders, what's the most important thing that we need to do now, given COVID-19, given the slope, uh, given where we are on progress to the SDGs, to address challenges linked to SDG implementation, such as the real risk of people not just being left behind, but being pushed further behind in some cases. Number two, the impacts of COVID-19, and finally, closing civic space while also working in collaboration. Deirdre? 
Okay, I'll be very brief, Lily, and uh, sorry for racing through my presentation like that, but I didn't want to, to delay any other speakers. So just to say, I think the biggest thing that civil society can do now to really, and it's great, and I'd like to, to recognise what the EU has done in terms of it has highlighted an enabling environment for civil society as a key programming priority for the coming years, which means that a lot more EU funding will be directed to supporting and, and you know, assisting civil society to become really a, a much more, uh, or to enable it to become a, devel a development actor in its own right in contexts where it is not yet. I would say what we need to do as civil society is to think outside the box and work with other stakeholders. So in other words, look around and see, can the private sector work with this? Can philanthropic organizations work with this? Can academics work with this? And we need to really embrace this multi-stakeholder model of implementation that's at the heart of the SDGs, because I think other actors can help us. You know, we're not going to be able to win this battle of closing civic space on our own. So we need to find common calls with other actors working also on issues that are similar to, to ours and to um, form partnerships with them and uh, to work also with donors and international and regional actors to make sure that we're working together to try to push back against closing civic space. And I think there's so many positive things that are happening i'll just mention very briefly before i finish that there's work going uh, happening at the moment on developing alternative narratives so civil society developing positive narratives to try to transform public attitudes to civil society which again provides a lot more protection for civil society in contexts where it's working so thanks very much lily and back to you nasmal i'll be really really interested to hear your thoughts on, on, on what do you think the most important thing is so that we make sure that no one's left behind. Uh, thank you very much. I would focus on the three uh, aspects, but in a very short way. That is the, I, I think really in, in the context of COVID, I think we need to address the digital divide in the, in, in the, in the, in, in the country whole to address the, sorry, um, I, I, we need to address the digital divide, you know, um, in terms of the reaching out to the very most marginalized group. Uh, in, in addition to that, actually, we need to focus on the, how can we generate our own kind of accountability mechanism, let's say a voluntary local review in, so that, you know, the SDGs are also localized and local government and local administration are practicing this, uh, you know, the SDGs as a framework for development to, to achieve the sustainable goals. Um, and finally, I would, I would like to focus on, you know, develop the uh, alternative data uh, from the civil society aspects to uh, hold the government accountable. You know, we, we need to push, really uh, push back to hard to the government with our own data. So what are the challenges our marginalized group are facing and how they are being excluded from the whole process in terms of the planning, in terms of the, you know, engaging the community, engaging the marginalized group, in, even in the monitoring process is very, very important for achieving gas disease. Thank you very much, Lily. Thank you, Nasmal. And last but definitely not least, Patrick, we would love to hear your thoughts on the question. Thank you, Lily. Well, I was thinking uh, perhaps one issue that we're discussing quite a lot with our delegations now is this issue about service uh, delivery. And, and uh, may we've try to sort of uh, say that we uh, will continue to support that, of course, in various priority sectors in the countries, but that we're trying to also shift more towards supporting civil society and being just that civil society. And maybe there also needs to be a demand for that from civil society. Uh, I don't want to put one against the other, uh, but just to underline how important I think it is for advocacy and and for civil society to uh, to fight for that space and for those democratic uh, principles within overall, but also within specific sectors uh, uh, in 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 the various country contexts. So maybe that's those are my two pennies on that question. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, we have heard from our panelists about. How, uh, how civil society really does have a crucial role to play and uh, in um, achieving the SDGs. They are actually a prerequisite um, to achieve the SDGs. A vibrant civic, civil society is absolutely critical. Um, and, and, and how through holding governments to account, we can begin you know, the process of making sure that the um, SDGs are implemented, but also that the principles um, behind the 2030 agenda, such as the pledge to leave no one behind, um, 
and partnerships are also crucial to that uh, to, to to implementing the SDGs. Louisa, thank you very much to our panelists. Louisa, over to you. Thank you so much, Lily, and thank you, Deirdre, Nazmo, and Patrick. Um, I now give way, it is my pleasure to give way to Ali Hanman from A4SD for his closing remarks. Welcome, Ali. Thank you. And over to you. Gracias, Luisa. Thank you so yeah. much. It's uh, wonderful to be able to uh, help to guide the, the sort of final remarks here on this uh, fantastic session. Um, it's really been very, very illuminating. Um, and from our side, from Action for Sustainable Development, we're also extremely glad to be part of this uh, very broad coalition um, that's been uh, so well uh, described and eloquently uh, represented through the various panels that you've heard from today. And really to pick up on some of the opening remarks uh, from Sarah Strack, it's really wonderful as civil society to be able to come together like this and to put forward some of our key uh, areas and key observations on the uh, delivery of the sustainable development uh, agenda. I think it's been interesting in the conversations that we've heard a lot about the reductions in civic space and the challenges that so many of our networks and friends and partners are facing in different parts of the world, and also the lack of measurability, the lack of data to actually understand what's really happening in terms of delivery of the SDGs. And I think it's been very welcome to hear from the UN uh, Development Corporation Office, as well as from the EU, um, in terms of some of the ways and channels that you uh, are able to open for civil society to be able to better engage and better shape the agenda from the national through to the global level. Um, and, and finally, I did want to mention from our side, there's uh, there are opportunities now for us working together to support national coalitions, um, from Action for Standard Development, we have some support through the Swiss government, who've also been very generous in supporting national coalitions. Um, and we know that many of you who are active in different countries will want to get involved in your VNR in this coming year, 2022. Um, so please do get in touch with us. Um, there's also opportunities through the major groups and other stakeholder process um, where uh, it sounds like a mouthful, but it's basically the opportunity for stakeholder views to be brought to the HLPF in July. So over the coming months, many of us will be working with you at the national level to connect uh, your learning and to bring that in uh, in the next round of the VNRs. So um, I would also like to mention that there will be a survey to all, everyone who's joined today um, to gather your feedback on any uh, thoughts that you have. Um, and really, at that point, again, just to reiterate, it's been a collaboration, Action for Sustainable Development, Action Aid, NND, Bond, CEPE, Corporation Canada, uh, the CSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness for us, Global Focus, ISD, Save the Children, Sight Savers, and World Vision. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, and thanks to all the participants for joining this seminar, for hanging out with us. Because among other things, this report is also a powerful advocacy tool. Our invitation is for everyone to keep the key messages alive, to share them, to reference the report. And as always, and like Oli invited us, give us your feedback, which we look forward to receiving. On behalf of all the organizations involved in the preparation of this report, I wish you a great week. Thank you. Merci. Gracias. And goodbye. <laughs>